Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Operations Room, a podcast for COOs. I am Brandon Mensinger, joined by my lovely co-host, Bethany Ayers. How are things going, Bethany? They're fine. You always ask me the same question, and yet every single time you ask me the question, I'm like, ooh, that's a new question. How am I going to answer it today? (laughs) It feels new. It feels fresh every time. (laughs) You think I should just, like, think about it in the morning, like, oh, Brandon and I are going to do one of our chats. He's going to ask me how I am. I should have an answer. (laughs) Every time it's surprising somehow. Every, and I have to go, oh, how am I going to say something interesting? <laughs> <laughs> so I do have a question for you, just because software is one of our favorite things to talk about. What is your least favorite piece of software? Well, that is a mighty fine question because I just had an example of this yesterday. So Microsoft Teams is by far the worst product on the planet, I would say. So I was presenting to a leadership team yesterday, or supposed to be, and it took 20 minutes basically of like fiddling with teams to try to make it work. And I do not know what was happening, but you know, we had the classic, they couldn't hear me. And then I called in and then we were having like me freezing on the screen. They switched up their Wi-Fi. I logged back in again. And then at that point, because we had 90 minutes uh, hard stop, we had to reschedule the call. I said to the people person, Hey, let's just have a quick chat about the rescheduling. So then we got onto a zoom call and guess what happens? It is absolutely perfect. And I'm just like, why don't we just start with Zoom to begin with, as opposed to like screwing around with Teams in this case? But this product is terrible. I agree. Are you on a Mac? I am on a Mac. It hates Macs. I'm working with a company that's on Microsoft. And so I now have all of the Microsoft products and I have to go on Teams and I have to also figure out like the team chat stuff. And whenever I go on it, my computer just sounds like it's about to take off. It eats up every bit of CPU my camera crashes all the time. Yeah, I hate it. So the entire Microsoft suite is what you're telling me. All of it. Yeah. I mean, Word has always been horrific, right? If you want to try and add a picture in or adjust a paragraph, it goes crazy and it always has. But Teams is bad. And now they're trying to add more features to make it more integrated and cool. And you can take notes in the side panel but then we don't really know where the notes have gone and they don't reappear. But every bit of your chat you've ever had with a person shows up on your team's chat with them. When I worked at SwiftKey, we were bought by Microsoft. So SwiftKey is a company, we're very much a Google suite company for the most part. And when Microsoft bought the company at some point, as always, they forced us to transition over to Microsoft 365. It was so clear to me like how awesome Google Docs is for collaboration purposes and uh, how terrible Word is for collaboration, at least at that point. This is back in 2016 or something, but it was night and day. I'm sure it's improved since then, but yeah, Microsoft 365 is not the best experience. I'm not entirely convinced it has improved and also might be user, like the way people tend to use their, do their workflows. But we were reviewing a contract and the first two people reviewing the contract sent it as an attachment on email. And so therefore you ended up with the multiple version hell and somebody finally moved it over to SharePoint. And then people were editing that, but it was still quite glitchy. I opened it up accidentally on my browser because that's how it defaulted. And then I could do nothing and then had to like transfer it to Word. It's just not seamless. Google Docs now has full functionality, but when I first started using it, I had spent my life in Microsoft and was a PowerPoint super user. And so when I first moved to slides, I was just like, what is this? I can't even indent or control where my bullets show up. Why would anybody use this? But it's a perfect example of one killer feature, and that was collaboration. And once I got over not being able to control bullet points, I realized that that beat everything else. All right. So we have got a wonderful topic for today, which is do COOs and scale-ups have a shelf life? And we are talking to Casey Wu. He is a seven-time CFO and co-founder of the Operations Guild. And we'll have that conversation with him. Just a bit of a warning alert. That conversation kind of goes off track to a certain extent. And we start talking about option grants and the terms around option grants that are important for COOs specifically. So watch out for that. That's a great conversation as well. So before we get to our chat with Casey, a bit of a back and forth between Bethany and myself, I wanted to ask you two questions. And the first one is, is that true? Do COs have a shelf life in scale-up companies? Yes, I think so for 
two different reasons, hence my pause to think. One is having a favorite stage and or getting bored and or running too hard that you exhaust yourself. Those would be possibly all of my reasons. And also the company outgrowing you, not being able to keep up, not being able to learn with the changes. Yeah, that makes sense. And when do you think that transition point is in terms of the size of the organization? I would say there are multiple transitions and some people can carry on. Like the original COO of Salesforce, he went from being chief of staff to COO, made it to their first billion or maybe even their first billion quarter. So their first four billion. And then, then he was done and they needed a next level of professionalization. I would suggest that he is the outlier (laughs) and not, first of all, Salesforce is an outlier. And then to have somebody who manages to go from 10, 20 million, I don't know what it was, to 4 billion is particularly impressive. I think for us mere mortals, it'll be one or two stages. So there are people who really like the early, early stage. And once it gets past 100 people, stop enjoying life. And they love when it's three people. And as soon as it gets any size and bureaucracy, it's horrible. You have people like me and you who don't like the really early, early days, find it a bit of a grind. But once things are a bit established, 30, 40 people, I seem to reach a max around 350, but I'm still yet to figure out if that's because I'm exhausted or because it fundamentally changes at that point. And I'm sure there are people who are like, 350 is a horrible place to be. I want 3,000. Yeah, no, for sure. Because I kind of think about it in a couple of different phases, which is, I feel like phase one is always around just pure play growth. You are trying to grow the company, and that requires a tremendous effort from back office to support that growth. And the other part of growth really is the commercial and product to some extent, repeatable and predictable process to get the initial germination of PMF into a track, into a groove that can basically rinse and repeat over a cycle to get to the revenue that you need to for the organization. And then the phase after all of that is all around optimization, optimization of resources and efficiencies and these sorts of things. And I think those first two phases I really enjoy and I'm quite good at. The third phase is less me, I think, to be honest. The question is, when does that transition happen in the company? I think that's around 50 million ARR. I think it's around 250 employees. I think it's around that point where it starts to switch from huge growth, rinse and repeat kind of predictability to something a little bit more optimization oriented. And I could be wrong here, but it feels like it's roughly in that zone somewhere. I agree. Although I suspect somebody who's used to doing 2,000 or 20,000 companies would be shocked at how agile and fast everything still is with 250 people and how much needs to be. (laughs) It's all perspective. Yeah, that is so true. Lovely. So I will now ask you a second question because our conversation went off in this direction. So what is the best way to communicate the value of options to an organization? Because I know upon reflection, when I look back at my last company, we did a poor job of this, generally speaking. And it occurred to me during my last phase of the company that we should have done something dramatically different in terms of communicating that value. And I have a couple of thoughts here, but I'm going to pass this to you first, Bethany. What's the best way to really communicate that value to, to the company, do you think? So if you're talking about literal value, what we ended up using was Legi. And there's the other one that's like the bigger market leader. I can't remember what it's called. Do you remember? Uh, I know Legi, but I don't know the other. Legi as a product had some flaws. It wasn't fully formed, but if people wanted to understand what their options were literally worth today, it was a great way to go in there. And you can also see not only what are your options worth today, but as they vest what are they going to be worth tomorrow? So that really helped us have people understand the concrete actual value. Of course, you have to have an exit and then the tech market crashed and those valuations are probably not the same as what's in Lecce today, but it was a good indicator. If you're talking about more generally the value of why you should care about options, then it's around the culture of the organization, we're all owners, we are sharing the wealth. It's not just about the top table earning. 
So I would agree for sure with the visibility part, the awareness and visibility through a product like Legi, where anybody in the company with their particular option grant, they can look at that whenever they choose to, to understand where that's at, what that value is, and get a sense of what that trajectory might look like over time based on different circumstances and kind of quasi-scenario planning. So I think that's fabulous. I think for me, that was a missed trick. I think we should have done that for sure, because I think it's just a great way of making, making it clear to people that they should view this as part of their compensation. And it's obviously a variable component of compensation in this case. It can be talked about in that fashion, but it should be considered part of their comp package as opposed to some weird, unknown, abstract extra they don't quite understand in this case. <laughs> and the second bit is, you know, when it comes to the talent acquisition team, they have the salary bands for the roles that they're hiring for. But equally, they should also have clearly the option grant values associated to those particular roles and bands, basically, from the outset. So for the talent acquisition team, it's also not a mystery. And the talent acquisition team can also speak to the value of it to the prospective person to be hired. So they get it. They get that value. And it's not simply a question of X salary, but there's a broader comp package here. And this is kind of what it looks like and why it's valuable. And then the second piece of that that's related is, you know, when you have that internal career framework where you've got your framework for the evolution of a marketing role as an example, that marketer can clearly see step by step if they go up the chain of promotions, you know, here's what the bands look like, but here's also what the option grant increments are also going to look like for that individual as an example. And then the last bit is kind of the standard educational process, which is in the onboarding process, they should be versed on option grants and the value of that and the terms attached to that. And equally, the VP of finance or whoever is leading finance should probably on a yearly basis do kind of a roll call presentation just around what are options, what are the terms, why is that useful or not useful, and then refer them back to things like Legi for future purposes. So we did all of those things and it was really helpful. The one added was not just option grants tied to job role and seniority, but also a award for top performers at the end of the year. And so top performers could continuously increase their options. And it was a way of making top performance matter. Yeah, I absolutely love that. That's fantastic. So with that, why don't we transition over to our conversation with Mr. Casey Wu. I'm delighted to welcome Casey Wu to the podcast. I met Casey when he was doing a London or maybe European tour recently. And Casey is the founder of the Operators Guild, or previously being a CFO, COO, and a bunch of other things. Welcome, Casey. Thanks for having me. So you come to us today with uh, a bit of a thought, I think a thesis around the CEO role in scale-ups. So can you maybe share your thesis? Yes. So... I've had seven tours of duty at startups. I would say two to three of them were basically either the COO or pretty much acting as a COO slash CFO, and the rest are pure CFO. These companies range from pre-seed, A, B, C, D, pre-IPO, everything from pure SaaS to heavy operating uh, and prop tech. The other part of my knowledge base, as I before I lead up to this is having interviewed 1,100 operators one-on-one over 10 years. Uh, That's the OG. I interview almost every single person who applies. I've heard every story under the sun from every position under the operating umbrella. And I've watched all my friends go through the journeys. And I went through the journey. So what I'm about to say is a combination of 35,000 hours of doing, listening, and talking about COOs. I'll also caveat... CEO means a lot of things to a lot of different people in a lot of different countries and a lot of different stages. The ones I'm referring to will be early stage, high growth tech, generally VC backed. Early stage as in under a thousand people, maybe under 500 people. Now that I've defined it, I think there's a lot of my colleagues and friends who want to be COOs. And I always ask them why. There's all sorts of reasons. Well, a big one is like wide impact. A really big one is, well, I'm not a CEO and I don't want to be one. The third is, well, I'm not a CFO because that's accounting and financy and I'm not that. I'm also not a CRO. I'm not a salesperson, but I'm senior and I can do a lot. 
And I'm not biz ops. That's like a consultant or whatever. And like, so you all of a sudden have this role called a COO. That's from the person side. From the company side, and by the way, everything I say here is a kind of blanket statement, fire for effect. Okay, clearly this is not everything, but I'm doing this because I want people to think about this extreme view of COOs. In the US, I think COOs, they see Sheryl Sandberg, I think what, 15 years at Facebook, Tim Cook of Apple. It's sexy without the you know spotlight on them and is ultimate building, right? You're the number two at Apple or you're the number two at Facebook. And we love being number two, right? Don't care for the glory, but we care for the impact and the diversity of things to do. What I challenge people to think about is I think COOs having sat in the boardroom when we want to hire one, think about when someone even thinks about hiring a COO. Half the time, it's because the CEO is not doing something they should be doing and don't want to do. So I call it the one minus the yang or the yin to the CEO. It's not a job description that you can find a CEO. It's find the CEO one minus, that is your job. Cheryl was on the non-technical product side. Why? Magically, because Mark was product technical. Tim Cook is more supply chain, an actual supply chain, Apple. It's a hardware business. Steve Jobs was product, marketing, vision. They complement each other very, very well. So on one aspect, what is a COO? I think it's the complement to the CEO. The second, you can also call it a gap filler. Now, it could be filling the gap of a CEO. It could be filling the gap of, we don't have a product team. We have a nascent sales team. We don't even have an HR team. And the Navy SEALs come in called COOs, operators, who just fill the roles. We don't have any experienced people in the exec team. Yeah, you can call it the adults in the room, the all sorts, change agents. But notice, I'm setting this up for the life of a COO. If you flip everything I said on its head, there's a few dangerous things about being a COO. The first is, if the gaps are filled, what do you do? Your job is to fill the gaps, and eventually you fill them. You were doing kind of product because there's nobody. You just hired a head of product because it got big. You were doing sales-ish and marketing, and now you just hired a head of sales. Oh, and a head of marketing. You pretty much, what I call, like start chopping off your limbs. And that could be a great thing because the company's growing and you can afford them, and there's full-time need. But all of a sudden, what you started as is a very different job now. Whereas the head of sales, they, they keep the head of sales role. It's a swim lane. There are very distinct swim lanes in companies, finance, HR, et cetera. CEO is not a swim lane, in my opinion. It's a temporary interim gap fill one minus that keeps swaying with the business and changing. If the CEO changes what they want or care about, that changes you. Okay. So that's one aspect is it's not like a good or bad thing. It's just, it's a unique part of being a COO. And what that generally translates to is a very short tenure in a high growth company because things are changing so fast. Gaps are filling so fast. On the second side is political dynamics. Some CEOs have this very interesting power dynamic with the CEO, right? Because everyone sees that their CEO could be, are you outranking all the other execs? Are you the same? Do you lead them when the CEO is traveling? So there's internal CEO, external CEO stuff. But but without going on too long, those power dynamics are very fragile. I'll give you an example. I know of a CEO that got too good at their job. They made the CEO start to look bad. All the CEO meetings and the way they ran things were just, people just respected that person. They liked it. And the CEO didn't really like that. It was threatening them. Well, let's just say, who wins in a battle between a CEO and COO? Or a founder and a CEO? Uh, let's just say, magically, that person got marginalized. Second one could be, they sit down day one. What do you do and what do I do? Oh, I'm the CEO. Okay, great. Tell me where I have, we call it, who has the D? Who has decision making? Who has the D? Okay, you have the D on this. You have the, oh my God, I'm so happy you're here. Shiny object. This is really amazing. Oh, I've been dying to have you. Great. You have the D on all these th- departments. Great. Three months later, everything's going swimmingly well. CEO's running that and CEO's running that. And all of a sudden, the CEO calls in the CEO. Hey, um, I just heard from the sales team that you changed pricing. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I don't really think we should do that. Wait, but don't I have the D? You do until you don't. Okay. And so what happens after that? The decision gets reversed. And everyone on the team, this is a military understanding. All the troops are like, what just happened? Oh, the CEO really doesn't have final say. 
it's as you see, okay, great. The second of all is why are we meeting without the CEO then? It's a waste of time. Why don't we just go directly to the CEO? We call it like mom and dad problems. Who's the one that's going to make the call? That's why you have to be united. No different than in co-parenting or parenting is you can't confuse people who has decision-making. It really starts to undermine people or confuse. So then the undermining of the CEO starts to happen or they just start losing the power of this and that. And okay, great. Anyways, gets back to the gaps are filling and they don't need you anymore. Where it works, I think, really well is extremely clear divisions of duties and true decision-making, like at Facebook, like at Apple, or it's a real operating company. By real, I mean supply chain. Like COO is an actual function. Not a title, it's a function. They run the operations of Amazon, the operations of DoorDash. It's a physical type operation. I absolutely get it. And I also... We've had conversations around all of these. I think we've experienced them ourselves. One of the ones that is constantly comes up is decision-making power, particularly with founder CEOs, because how do you get it off of them? But one of the things I wonder about is like the 10 years, what, 18 months, two years, you can get a lot done in those 18 months, two years, rather than not being a CEO is the better option just to go in, back yourself and say, I can transform your business, solve so many problems in two years, but I want a two-year vesting schedule, not a four-year vesting schedule. 100%. That's exactly right, is engineer it and figure out for what reality is. And the reality is I'm going to do a bunch in two years, but it's a very gap-filling transitory role, and that's how it should be treated. Um, The second thing I would add to that is have a step two. So I think there's three types of COOs, generally speaking. There is COO, CFO, there's COO, CRO, and then there's COO, CEO. Translation, there's external commercial facing COOs that are pretty much salesy. And and then there's internal, very like people finance type COO. And then there's literally the internal CEO, like a Sheryl Sandberg. You position yourself that way. You tell the CEO, hey, By the way, this is how it generally goes. And first of all, a lot of them don't think that way. They don't realize that the CEO they're going to bring in is actually going to work themselves out of a job. But if you say that and go, if I do my job correctly, I will have no job in this form in 18 months. But what I really want to do is become the CRO after that or the CFO. And I'm qualified to do that for X or the internal CEO. Certain CEOs just want to be on the road. They want to be external. They don't actually care about internal. They like the outward. You obviously have to understand where the real permanent gap is, the permanent swim lane to fill. Why is that helpful? Because if you're going to be scheduled to be the CRO, you transition that way. You start to hire away all the non-CRO stuff and you can see more of your time becoming 20%, 30%, 50%, 80% sales. And then all of a sudden your title swaps, boom, you're in the seat. Now you are CRO and they're going to need a CRO forever. It's very clear what a CRO does and the reporting lines and decision-making done. And you've done both. You've helped transform. And then now you sit in the next seat that you help create. But if you don't say that, they're going to be looking for a CRO while you're building. There's nothing wrong with being a scale-up CRO. It's just setting the expectations that it's more of a two-year than a four-year forever. And I think all life is expectation-based. So many operators, when they get a role, whoever thinks about joining a, an awesome company for two years? Like no one goes in there, I think, well, except if you're us, right? And you're like, mm, this is probably a two-year thing, right? But that's also the point that I think is a very important point you're making is just, just understand there's like a two-year cycle. There's really two chapters here, not just one. Yeah. And actually, I only learned that in retrospect. So the first time I was there for five years, I had cliff vesting options, which it doesn't even exist anymore. It was my first time in a startup role. I didn't understand what I was signing up for. And then I was like, okay, I've been here for ages. What do you mean? I don't get anything until there's an event ever. And so after about year two, year three, I was finished, but I stuck those five years out. And then I was like, aha, I'm never doing that again. And now the market doesn't have it. So I'm going to do a four-year vesting schedule. And again, after three years, I was done, but I stuck it out for those four. This is new to me because I'm trying to listen to what you're saying is when you say cliff, you mean literally the only way to get all of your options is a liquidation event. So that's what used to happen in the UK. 
10, 15 years ago. So it doesn't happen anymore, but that's how the UK used to be structured. And now obviously with more tech, you get time-based options. But it's just through my own personal experience where I realized that it's not so much, I just personally lose interest after those couple of years. Once a company gets too big and it becomes a PR job rather than an actual operator job, I don't want to do it anymore. And so for me to get tied into four years, I don't want to do. Maybe we can do two years so you can give me a really great bump for the next two. But I want that value I've created in those first two years is commensurate with the amount of options that I'm given at the start. Stock options are a great deal for companies. They're a fantastic deal. They're very, 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 very onerous and should be discounted very heavily for operators. In the US, US tax is horrible. So in the UK, it's much better. I'm not even talking about taxes. Okay, right. Because the US taxes make options really painful. Oh, oh, that's just one of many really bad things. The number one reason why stock options are so painful is the money it takes to exercise them. But again, in the UK, we have very different strike prices. Yeah, I'm only talking US. The other thing is if it's meaningful, generally it's meaningful. Like by definition, you know, there's some big unicorn people where they have such meaningful stock that it's 100, 200,000, 300,000, but I haven't even thrown in the, the exercise window yet. It's one thing to come up with the money. It's another thing is you have 90 days. I mean, what? You, you paid me so low for three years and now I got to come up with, it doesn't even matter if it's 50,000. It doesn't matter if it's two. It's, you got 90 days before it's all mine again. Before I ask you this question, because I actually, I'm very curious what the US situation is, to be honest, but to Bethany's point, the UK is fantastic for this quite specifically because the HMRC, which is the taxation body in the UK, generally speaking for scale-ups, you can get strike prices that are 0. 0.0001 pence. Even in like year three, year four? They're closing the loops. Like it used to be that it was like a pence. And now there's been some changes post-COVID, but like a lot of times there was, you still have a super low strike price. Yeah, I mean, they're super low. So, I mean, just purely as an example, the last time I purchased uh, options at my last company, they literally cost me 50 pounds. So as an operator for the 90-day window, you can convert and you're, you're, you're good to go. Conversely, I've been in situations in the past where the strike price, to your point, is higher and is quite painful and the 90-day window is there. And in those cases, there's another vehicle that they provide to you in this case, which is less optimal, but it's still workable which is to actually not convert them after 90 days, but in fact, hold the options in perpetuity, which in the UK lasts for a 10-year window. So you can actually have them hanging as options, as an option grant out there on the cap table effectively without converting them into shares until there's an exit event. So there's still optionality in that case. But I guess just flipping it back to you, like what is the US situation then? Why is the strike price uh, so high? It's exactly what you said. Is What I teach in my like negotiating and offer classes is... One of the number one most valuable things you can negotiate, even beyond severance or whatever, is extending your exercise window to 10 years, which looks like you guys have already done. Now, I think it's becoming a little bit more acceptable and employee-friendly for companies to say, we don't have the 90-day, we have the two-year, three-year, four-year, 10-year. If you think about it, it makes zero sense to have a short window. You're talking about early companies. By definition, they need time to get to any point of value, let alone any point of liquidation event. It's so counter to have such a short window on something that's a toddler. If anything, toddlers need the long time, you know, whereas Google doesn't need, Google's instantaneous, like it should be quick. So everything was backward, but yeah, it's moving toward ask for a longer window. And now founders and CEOs are realizing it's not an unfair request. At first it was like, what are you talking about? Here's the irony. Most founders don't understand options because... Or they have very few compared to the rest of what they own. Yeah. So the number of time Operators Guild members have to teach the CEO trying to hire them, can I have a longer exercise window? And goes, what is that? Well, what are you asking for? Did you know it's 90 days? Huh? Yeah. So what's wrong with that? Well, you don't pay me any cash. So how do I do that? And then if you tell them about it, they start to learn. So that's happening in the US. I think it might just be helpful for like a little bit of what we've learned on options in general. So there's negotiate as long a window for buying as possible. Because Brandon, that's not like, it'll be in the articles of association. And so you need to actually negotiate on top of it because the articles will often be 90 days. So you need to go when negotiating that. 
Yeah. So I'll double down on that, Bethany, because you're right. That is not normal. The one I just described for the 10-year option grant holding period is not normal. And you have to do exactly what you said, which is basically make a request for them to do it. Yeah. So there's that. You can't really negotiate strike price, unfortunately, but you should always ask and find out what it is for the grants, that, for the options you're about to be granted, because it will change over time with the different rounds. So always ask and find out what the strike price is. And also have it be time-based and don't have it be anything but linear time-based, or if you can, get it so it's accelerated time vesting. So that it's, you know, 25, 25, 25, 25, or ideally 50, 50, but also look at what happens at the point of an exit and whether or not it's accelerated vesting at an exit, or if you're tied into whatever happens afterwards. And then the final one is understand the good lever provision or the provision for levers. If you're a good lever or bad lever by default and what that looks like, because what can happen is if they have a really bad good lever that the board has to decide that you're a good lever, they can just take your all your options away from you. So when you're negotiating, this has nothing to do with the topic today, but it just come up. Those are the areas that you should look at when you are negotiating your options and deciding whether or not it's a good deal. Yeah, that, that is million dollar or million pounds of value right there. Uh, it took me a long time to come up with that exact same list. Yep. Oh, and severance, which is kind of a good lever thing. And then if you do that, that's the best you can do for yourself. Yeah, and actually, it's amazing in, in one way, because Bethany, we've never spoken about this before, but if I was to make two recommendations, it was almost exactly the same thing I was going to say, which is fundamentally, in your Articles of Association, you are considered to be a bad lever by default, which means that if the board decides that for whatever reason they don't like you, you're hoop basically, which means that it can be relationship driven, you getting screwed out of your options and you don't want to be in that position. So what you need to do is go back to the board or the articles of association. And I do this for the companies, never mind myself, but get it reversed where it's a good lever where they can only take away your option grant if there's been like gross negligence or something crazy, basically, where you've done something really silly, essentially. And that's an important lever to ensure that the board doesn't have discretionary ownership over your your livelihood. And I think the other point around the acceleration of the vesting, massively critical, which is you do not want to be in a situation where, you know, you've been there for, I don't know, 18 months, 24 months, and the company is being bought, and you have two years of options that you're you're not getting, essentially, because at the end of the day, if you can help that company sell faster because you've done phenomenal work, you should get compensated for that, which means that your four-year vesting period should collapse into that two-year period if the company's bought after two years of your vested options. Yeah, the other reason I think to add on, to, we call it double trigger, single trigger. Uh, maybe that's what you call it as well in, in Europe. Single trigger is literally instantaneously when it transacts. It doesn't matter what happens to you, you will get acceleration. Double trigger is if they let you go and your employment is affected within 12 months, generally you then get accelerated. And double trigger for operators, senior operators is a very good one because when you generally get bought, or a change of control, you don't need two COOs. You don't need two CFOs. You don't know, this is my, my argument when I asked for it. You know, other positions maybe, but it's like by definition, it's going to basically replace me, right? And so it makes total sense for CEOs, COOs, CFOs to have a double trigger or a single trigger or in your case. And what's interesting I just learned is I didn't realize your default was bad lever. So I would say we don't have that situation here. For the most part, default is unless you do something fraudulent or bad, I think boards and companies are pretty good with, thanks for your help. This is termination for good reason, rather than that we call it good reason or bad reason. But yeah, so I learned a lot. That's really interesting. Totally not the topic, but there you go. Like uh, not to get screwed when your two-year tenure ends. <laughs> I go back to like the COO position or the CFO position or whatever early stage position is not a 10-year tenure. Right. And so this topic is very relevant about aligning your tenure with your compensation. Yeah. And I think, Casey, this goes back full circle to what you started with, which is missionary versus mercenary. I think, to be honest, if you're a CEO of the company, you are very much both in some ways, because at the end of the day, you are on a mission to transform that organization as a scale up company into something that, that's unrecognizable to what you joined and to create tremendous success. You know, and part of that value that you're creating directly is line of sight directly to those option grants and that vesting and that valuation to be there at the end of it and that, and that golden pot that we talked about. So this is not so much around 
massive salaries or consulting rates or whatever. It's just, I am there to transform this company. We are on a mission. We build the value in the organization and we sell this company and we are compensated for that. So I think there is a bit of a hybrid of the, uh, both in that case. Casey, we're rapidly running out of time, unfortunately. I feel like we've only barely started our conversation today. Before we go, we always like to ask guests, what's the one thing you should take away from the conversation today? I think the one thing is thinking about companies and scale-ups through their stages and evolution and less so titles. Once you see the world in that angle, everything from negotiating compensation to your career path, to seeing around the corner, to the staging of things, which is really what a lot of operating growth operators are, you have to stage things, I think become very, very clear. And once you just see it that way, everything just starts to make sense. You know, why things are two years here, why things are four years more so in, in London, like it just starts to make sense. So that's what I would say is, once you understand that concept, and it's not about titles and functions, and I'm going to be here for six years, and putting things in the perspective of stage, political dynamics, VC dynamics, as people learn all these things, all of a sudden, you can pick and choose how you want to play that. And more importantly, the expectations you set are realistic. You know what you're getting into. So what I'll say is, after my little COO diatribe, I had a Operators Guild member who's like, yep, I agree with everything you said, and I am so down to be gone in 18 months. Perfect. That's what I like to do. I transform and get out. Great. But a lot of people go in not understanding that, and that's all I'm saying. Just understand what you're getting into. So that is a lovely way to summarize the conversation. So thank you, Casey, for joining us in the operations room. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe or leave us a comment, and we will see you next week.